Good afternoon and uh, a very warm welcome to those of you in the room and those of you in the virtual room. Um, we have a lecture this afternoon by Claudia Lang, who is visiting us from uh, Germany. Um, just to introduce Claudia, um, she holds uh, a Heisenberg position at the University of Leipzig and is a research associate also at the Max Planck Institute for Social and Anthropology in Halle. Um, she's uh, been an ERC funded postdoctoral fellow with Global Health uh, in Paris. And she's also held academic positions at the University of Munich, Münster and Leipzig. Um, her research focuses on health related transformation processes and their impact on politics, ethics, and care practices in globalizing societies. Her regional focus is South Asia, which is what has brought her to India, not just on this trip, but many, many times in, in the last many years. Um, she is currently investigating the reconfiguration of mental health and uh, care, healthcare in the context of digitization. Um, her other areas of work include global health, the globalization, translation, and experience of psychiatric categories, the reconfiguration of suffering, Ayurvedic psychiatry, community healthcare, etc. And most recently, she has become interested in health and mental health in the context of planetary health, um, which I think may have some bearing on, on her topic today. Um, she is uh, the author of a book titled Depression in Kerala, uh, Ayurveda and Mental Health Care in the 21st Century, and the co-editor of a volume called Global Health for All, Knowledge, Politics, and Practices, as well as another volume, The Movement for Global Mental Health, Critical Views from South and Southeast Asia. Um, so I'm very, very happy. Um, to, 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 to welcome uh, Professor Claudia Lang. Um, she'll be speaking on environmental health um, with a hyphen uh, between, uh, in the midst of the word environmental, um, suffering care and repair in toxic urban environments in India. Claudia. Hello and namaste. Thanks um, Ananya for the invitation and the friendly, generous, introduction. Also thanks to Dipu, Ravin, and everyone else for their help in making this talk possible. I'm really deeply honored to be in this place. A slightly, is it okay with the mic? Is it, should it be... If this is off, is it okay? Okay. Sorry for this. So I've slightly changed um, the title of this talk. It's now Environmental Health, Distress, Care, and Repair Amidst Environmental Damage. I want to start with my apologies. What I'm presenting here are some very preliminary ideas and thoughts, rather speculative than ethnographic, drawing from various sources and inspirations for a possible framing or scaffolding of an emerging ethnographic research project in India. You might, you might find it a bit collage-like or essayistic because that's what it is. What I try to do here is to bring various literatures into a hopefully fruitful conversation to think about mental health in the context of climate change and environmental loss. Can you, I mean, we just forgot the first slide. So, so that was the first slide. Can you go to the second one, please? Thanks. I will proceed in four steps. First, I will talk briefly about climate change and its relation to health in the city. Second, I want to walk you through some of the effective dimensions of these changes, damages, and losses. I will talk about new concepts to grasp these effective dimensions, and will think about grief as a way of effectively relate to the environment 
in the contemporary moment. Third, I want to think a bit about ruination, world's endings and temporalities. What it means to continue life when worlds are coming to an end. How do people imagine the end of a world? What can we learn from the ways people go on with their lives after worlds have come to an end or fallen apart? And fourth, I, it's still this one. And fourth, I introduce the concept of repair to think about minor forms of remaking selves, communities, and environments in times of climate change. Before I start, a few terminological remarks. Climate change narrowly defined is different from, but also related to air and water pollution, soil depletion, toxic worlds that we inhabit, or biodiversity loss. However, I will follow other social scientists who use the term climate change in a broader sense, including not only global warming, but also anthropogenic um, pollution, environmental damage, biodiversity loss, and increasingly toxic worlds. And we can discuss, of course, about the use of the terms, but this is how like, climate change um, is being used by um, social scientists increasingly. So all these problems are, of course, deeply intertwined in highly complex ways. And my second remark concerns my use of the term environment. As historians and anthropologists um, have shown, the environment as a concept in the way that I use it here, along with its associated binaries of nature, culture, human nature, mind, matter, and so on, has emerged, of course, at a certain moment in the intellectual history of thought and is far from universal. Moreover, as I'm sorry, I know your name as Deepu, but I try to ava Avadendra Sharan. So I just say Deepu, right? As you point out in your book, In the City, Out of Place, there has been, and this is interesting, a conceptual thing, a shift in thinking about urban environments uh, in the last decades, including not only sanitation, but also industrial pollution as a matter of concern. So you go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> um, so climate change and health in the city. Climate change broadly conceived is linked to human and more than human health in myriad and um, highly complex ways. Climate change affects health in the now and in the future as does the slow violence of toxic legacies. New approaches such as planetary health try to address this complexity by considering human health as not only inextricably linked to ecological health and planetary forces, they also scale into the future, aiming not only at current health justice, but also at the health for future generation, promoting a political subject based on generation rather than, or maybe additional to nationality, class, and gender. Although climate change is a global phenomenon, its experience is local or regional. And that's why scholars in India, for example, Amita Baviskar or Deepu, sorry for this abbreviation, have called for place-based studies and local articulations of climate change. Similarly to considering what um, Amita Baviska calls Indian Anthropocene, or um, anthropologist Gabriel Echt in um, Africa calls the African Anthropocene. With their own genealogies, articulations, and political ecologies and economies. In Delhi, for example, people inhabit increasingly heated, air polluted, water depleted and polluted, uninhabitable worlds as combined and uneven effects of global and more local political, ecological, economic, and social forces. Moreover, exposure to industrial pathogens and climate-related health effects is uneven and intersect with other forms of inequality and local biologies related to class, caste, or gender. Often difficult to pinpoint in a single cause and effect manner, Climate changes and toxins slow violence accumulates differently in differently situated bodies. 
and mitigation efforts are often complicated by wider politics of knowledge and percep perceptibility. The health effects of these environmental changes are myriad. To pick out just one that's, I think, super crucial for Delhi, air pollution alone significantly increases the risk for heart diseases, lung diseases, cancer, asthma, diabetes, headaches, and chronic coughing. Recent studies also provide evidence of possible links of air pollution and strokes, brain ischemia, so the, the limited oxygen supply to the brain or brain development. Although air pollution affects everyone, exposure, again, is uneven, as are the possibilities um, of technological fixes, such as air purifiers. So less known, however, about the mental health dimensions of climate change and what it means psychologically to live in increasingly toxic and damaged environments. And it is these that I will turn to now. The next slide, please. So it's now about climate change affects and mental distress. Since the early 2000s, scientists and scholars have come up with several terms to grasp or conceptualize forms of emotional, psychological, or existential distress related to present or anticipated ecological and or climate change. Let me walk you through some of them. The aim is not to provide you with a lexicon of curious terms. Rather, I show that people have developed these terms to render the unrecognizable recognizable, to enable the articulation of otherwise unspeakable aff affects and emotions. They are ways to be able to talk about and mourn environmental loss. And these terms are all coined outside the Indian context. But um, as I hypothesize, they, are well, they can be well applied here as well, some of them. Yeah, so environmental grief is a term coined by thanatologist Chris Kevorkian. As a scholar of death, dying, and bereavement, Kevorkian de defined environmental grief as, I quote, the grief reaction stemming from the environmental loss of ecosystems caused by natural or man-made events. The phrase came to public attention in 2016 in an article in Scientific American. And two years later, the parallel term ecological grief appeared in a Nature article by, so by social scientists Ashley Kunzolo and Neville Ellis. Drawing on ethnographic studies with Inuit communities in Northern Canada and farmers in Australia's wheat belt, the authors described a sense of loss across three planes, physical, ecological losses, disruptions to environmental knowledge and identity, and anticipated future losses. Australian philosopher Glenn Albrecht invented many terms to talk about what he calls earth emotions or earth-related mental health states. The most popular one is solastalgia, a term Albrecht coined in the early 2000s in the aftermath of the shock people experienced through large open-cut coal mining in New South Wales in Australia. A composite of solace and algia or pain it refers to a feeling of desolation or melancholia about the emplaced and lived experience of the chronic deterioration of a loved home environment. It is a kind of nostalgia for something that's lost that occurs in those who have not left their home environment, a kind of emplaced melancholia. And if you want to have a look at this book, Earth Emotions, you might find many other terms that he coined in order to grasp different, different emotions relation related to, 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 to environmental damage. The next slide, please. So while grief is oriented to a past that is experienced to be lost, 
other terms such as climate anxiety or eco-anxiety that also emerged in the 2010s describe a shared sensation of future dread, which seems to be quite common, not only amongst youth, at least in the place where I come from. I'm not sure about India yet. Um, yeah. So not only about youth, but also amongst scientists who work on climate change. So eco-anxiety and climate anxiety have also made it into psychological and psychiatric discussions around whether they should be included or not into the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the handbook of, of psychiatrists in the US, as new categories of psychiatric disorder. And this is obviously problematic as the cartoon shows. Can you read this? So, yeah. The next slide, please. A third register links environmental suffering to despair, existential crisis, or trauma. Terms such as eco-angst, coined by behavioral science reporter Daniel Goldman in 2009, or climate despair that got popular through a Vice article in 2019, refer to a sense that climate change is an unstoppable force that will render humanity extinct and renders life in the meantime futile, conjuring apocalyptic imaginaries from the book of Revelation, a source book for Western anxiety about the end of the world, as Davis Wallace Wells noted in his bestseller, The Uninhabitable Earth. Together with environmental melancholia or climate trauma, these terms describe less pathological states, but rather radical existential framing and lived experience of what it means to live and be human in the Anthropocene. All these terms also refashion questions around grievability of lives, livelihoods, life forms, and landscapes. In her text, Frames of War, When is Life Grievable? Philosopher Judith Butler has drawn attention to the unequal allocation of what she calls grievability. A grievable life, she writes, is a life that is deemed worthy of mourning after it is lost. In order to be grievable, however, she argues, a life has to first be recognized as a life, which is not always the case. Pol political communities are thus perpetually engaged in a struggle to determine whose lives and losses are grievable. While Butler does not speak about environmental grief, her ideas about the grievable are helpful for conceptualizing a politics of the grievable in the Anthropocene. For example, in his writing on environment disasters in the Himalayas, anthropologist Rahul Ranjan saw a differential allocation of grief and mourning evidenced by the structural apathy of those in power towards the fragile ecology of the Himalayas and the humans who inhabit the place. By rendering environmental grief and despair recognizable, these terms and conceptualizations contribute to including environmental damage into the spectrum of, of objects that are deemed grievable. This brings me to my next point. Apart from bringing loss, dying, and world's endings, apart from bringing emotional, psychological, or existential distress in the, into the picture of climate change, I argue that we need ethnographic studies on world's endings to understand how people have effectively and ethically inhabited worlds that are dying. So this is a fascinating, an interesting painting that I just found this morning in the internet. Uh, it comes from a street art project in Delhi's Lodi colony. And the project aims to raise awareness about air pollution by using paint upcycled from pollutant. So the paint is produced by a clean tech startup that uses an emission control devices to capture, I don't know how it works, particulate, 
particulate matter and thus purifies the air. And the byproduct is then converted into paint and ink, which can be used for painting. And this is obviously how this <laughs> image came about. So what does it mean to continue life when worlds are coming to an end? How do people imagine the end of the world or a world? What can we learn from the ways people go on with their lives after worlds have fallen apart? For conceptualizing how to ethnographically approach these questions, I take inspiration from recent writings and talks of and conversations with um, scholars from various backgrounds. And this is obviously just the beginning of a conversation um, which needs to be expanded. In 2018, Ashis Nandi, I don't know if he's here, there, gave a talk at the World Leaders Forum at Columbia University. The talk was titled Cities of the Mind, Lost Cities and Their Inhabitants. A lost city, as he defined it in the talk, is a city of the mind, a city that can be found in shared memories, tales, but also in art and literature. A lost city refers to a city's earlier life, continuous and substantial presence in the minds of those who remember it, whether they are staying in the city or are exiled from it. Lost cities are distinct from their real counterparts. I suggest that it is not only cities that can be lost in Nandi's sense, but also environments. And these lost environments can provoke sentiments similar to Glenn Miller's solastalgia I mentioned before. So the melancholia about the emplaced and lived experience of the chronic deterioration of a loved home environment. This also applies to cities' environments. Air pollution, intolerable heat, polluted rivers, or disappearing trees, and their consequences all may provoke a sentiment of a lost urban environment, another kind of a lost city. Shortly after and following up on Nandi's talk, the same title in Delhi, Ananya wrote, an opinion piece in the Hindu metropolis of the mind, how Delhi has become a shadow of its own self, of its old self. Drawing from Ashis Nandi, Ananya describes how Delhi is fast becoming a lost city to its inhabitants. There are many facets of Delhi as a lost city, architectural, political, and so on. But one is also environmental. Ananya describes that the Delhi of her childhood with winter sunshine, blue skies, lives now only in memory as air pollution takes its grasp over Delhi's inhabitants as does water scarcity and exposure to toxicants. A form of damage that manifests in coughing bodies, lung cancers or asthma, asthmas. The Delhi that lives on in her and other memories is one that has not been lost to environmental pollution and climate change. As she beautifully put it, we are condemned to struggle for the rest of our days to mentally re-inhabit that ideal of blue sky, green grass, broad avenues, massive trees, a flowing Yamuna, clean air, and slumbering mon monuments. What used to be our home becomes a site of legend, end of quote. And so then, Delhi, a city that is increasingly becoming uninhabitable, a toxic city, also becomes a lost environment, an environment li that lives on only in the minds of those old enough to remember, like a ghost in a spectral presence. Environmental loss may not only destroy livelihoods, worlds, and relations, it also unmakes selves. When we lose environments, we also lose parts of ourselves. How can we live in a damaged environment? How do people, and more than humans, inhabit a dying world, even while they strive and flourish, or at least try to do so? How do they, in other words, continue alive in a world that is coming to an end? 
Worlds end in multiple ways and continue to do so. Worlds as we know them end, whether it is in the form of the dying of a city, a river, a forest, a glacier, a child, a parent, an idea, a dream, or a relationship. But lives continue. People go on with their everyday life in a, in a mode that we could be called a mode of the despite even after worlds have fallen apart. On environments, multiple endings and new lives, anthropologist Anna Tsing and colleagues write in a book with the title, The Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet. I quote, the landscapes grown from such endings are our disaster as well as our greedy hope, end of quote. So if looked closely, we see not only the traces of past violence and ruination in dying landscapes, but also life's flourishing and striving happening in the midst of ruination and world's endings. Pollution, toxics, toxins, and heating are traces of both past and present anthropogenic damage. In these industrial ruinations, however, Life is not only coming to an end, but ruination might also enable new flourishing in the midst of ruination. As for example, those who know her, Anna Singh has famously, famously shown um, in her book on the Matsutake mushrooms and, and, and their foragers. How can we explore ethnographically how people imagine and inhabit world's endings? In a recent talk in the context of a workshop on Buddhism in the Anthropocene at the Max Planck Institute in Halle, anthropologist Robert Desjalais spoke about learning how to die in the Anthropocene and reflected about what it might mean to live in a dying world on the basis of his earlier research with the Yolmo in Nepal. For the Yolmo, I hope I pronounced them correctly. For the Olmo, dying requires what Dejale calls spectral care, a form of care for the deceasing, where the living help the dying to die well. They care for the dead without response, so they don't know what the effects of their actions are. Using the Yolmo spectral care as a lens, Robert speculated whether we similarly need to find forms of care for the future of the planet without knowing the effects of our actions. Is this an ethics of living in a dying world? Is there a need to accept ways of living with less certainty and limited agency? If dying is the absence, the absolute absence of agency, do we need to learn how to die? These are all Robert's questions. From a different angle, anthropologist Cecilia van Hollen approached the question of how people imagine the end of the world in the context of a growing cancer crisis in India. In her recent book, Van Hollen chronicles how low class, low caste women in rural Tamil Nadu are imagining and experiencing cancer and set their own temporal experience within deep time. These women, she observed, brought together subaltern critique, local biologies and cosmologies to make sense of cancer. Crucially, they imagined cancer as a sign of the inhumane, unjust and amoral contemporary era resembling the Kali Yuga and thus weaving biographical and cosmological time. These women elicited the Kali Yuga with its degradation of dharma to make sense of contemporary political, economic, and social injustice resulted, resulting in their weakened bodies and finally cancer. If in this and in other contexts, Kali Yuga serves as a framework through which people frame change and degradation, I wonder what would it mean for an ethics and phenomenology 
of inhabiting damaged environments in a world that is ending to mobilize cyclical, cyclical notions of cosmical time where one world's ending is another one's beginning. The next slide, please. If the planetary, the cosmic or cosmological and the deep time of climate change are hard to imagine and to address, an analytic turn towards the minor seems appropriate. Minor gestures of addressing major crises are the small things that often get obscured by focusing on macro scales. Looking at these minor gestures, we may find ordinary, everyday, and often intimate forms of repairing worlds. Anthropologists have shown how people continue to survive and live ordinary lives in the midst of violence, destruction, and endings. And Vina Das's work among subaltern women in Delhi is a famous example for this. What new forms of care, of relating and sociality might emerge from living in environmentally damaged and dying worlds? In this final part, I look into ways people endure toxic environments or dooming environmental loss by engaging in a new way, in new ways of care and relating that enable environmental repair in a minor scale. Loosely building on Hassan Hage's and others' recent thinking on repair, environmental repair can be described as a way people carve out viable lives amidst states of permanent environmental damage and dying worlds. A focus on minor acts of repairing enables, I suggest, to attend to ways people remake selves, relations with others and with the environment amidst toxic and dying worlds. Let me illustrate what I mean by this with two examples. Yeah, you can keep this. The area around the town of Putunjavi is the most polluted industrial compound in Chile. So we move quickly for a short moment to Latin America. No, you can, you go back, it's fine, it's this one. Anthropo anthropologist Manuel Tironi was interested in how people who suffer the bodily consequences of this toxic exposure know and act upon the chronic sufferings. Instead of just giving in or giving up, he shows how people repair their worlds in a minor way by caring and attend to human and non-human others. For example, people carefully attend to minor changes in their plants for signs of carbon burning in neighboring industrial plants so that they know when it is dangerous for themselves and their children to go out and rather stay inside. Or they engage in caring for these plants by every day removing dust from their leaves that comes from industrial toxic clouds to help these plants flourish in, <clears throat> in spite of this being a rather futile endeavor, repairing not only plants, but also their own sense of deprived agency. As they create conditions for flourishing in a minor mode, in a devastating landscape, they engage in forms of what Tironi calls intimate activism, different from the more well-known public forms of political activism. Other anthropologists, the next slide, please. Other anthropologists too show how in the context of climate change activism, the private and everyday becomes part of political struggle Again, in a form of intimate activism, people engage in everyday acts that they consider to bring about inner and outer transformations in trying to hold climate change at bay. As my colleague Arne Harms at the Max Planck shows, for example, for um, Extinction Rebellion, you know, the climate change activism group, I don't know if it's very active here in India. So he shows for Extinction Rebellion climate activists in Germany 
that people regard self-care and care for others as much as part of their political struggle than their more public protests. What is interesting for the purpose of this talk is also that they engage in collective mourning for what has been or is being lost in this moment of climate crisis, mass extinction, and environmental ruin. One of the activists, Joanna Macy, calls for what she calls resurrecting mourning. This form of collecting mo collective mourning, according to the activists, not only allows people to live truthfully, the act of mourning also articulates and makes emotionally available love for what has been lost. Mourning thus itself becomes a form of repair. It enables, as Arne writes, realignment and action to protect what is lost or threatened and thus becomes an engine of hopeful action in acting mutual dependence and mutuality. So these are just two small examples. Maybe you can go to the next slide. These are just two small examples of how people in other parts of the world engage in care and repair in the light of environmental destruction. And this, I just copied it in because this is a one of the many um, activities of tree planting in in Delhi amongst children. And I would suggest that these are also just minor forms of repair. These are, of course, many other, uh, there are, of course, many other ways. And I'm sure everyone in this room and in the air will have their own thoughts and observations of how people engage in care, repair, and not lose hope despite the immense destruction and endings which we inhabit. So I've pre presented here fragments of my own thinking and inspirations from others about what, what, what one might call environmental health with this hyphen, or ways to look at mental health in the midst of environmental damage and loss. I started from the assumption that mental health is still under-researched in the field of climate change, although people have developed terms and concepts to think about climate change's mental and emotional dimensions. These conceptualizations, I then suggested, are incomplete without a deeper thinking about the existential dimensions of continuing life when worlds are coming. And I try to end on a somehow hopeful note by describing examples of how minor forms of environmental repair might look like. I think of these fragments as building blocks for, for a yet unfinished scaffolding of a possible future research project in India. The main purpose of this presentation for me was to initiate a conversation and hence I'm very much looking forward to hear your thoughts on this. Many of you have worked on these issues much longer than I have. And of course, you all experience what it means to live in an inhabitable city on a daily basis. So thanks for listening. And I'm looking forward to your thoughts. Many thanks, uh, Claudia. It was very thoughtful and disturbing at the same time. Um, <clears throat> so many you said you you said you didn't want to uh, necessarily just impose this new lexicon on us, but in fact, I I made a list of of, of so many terms which I've heard for the first time, articulated uh, exactly precisely, and I found them uh, at least at first encounter to be genuinely. Uh, useful in terms of uh, giving words to to how one feels or what one experiences or what one sees around one, uh, and for which, as you as you pointed out, we have not had a vocabulary for uh, until very recently, and and many of us are are still not familiar with uh, with many of these terms. Uh, 
um, you know, I mean, I myself have lived on this planet through the last 10 years, experiencing many of these things. And I didn't necessarily uh, understand that, that they were bigger than me uh, or bigger than a few people I know, um, you know, that, that they are um, genuinely now becoming part of the human condition. So I think it's very important to identify and name these sorts of affect uh, these states of mind and consciousness and these forms of uh, ethics and practice and so on, as you said. Um, and I think that you're quite right to point out that, you know, they need to be ethnographically mapped um, and, and locally understood and contextualized um, because, uh, you know, that that deepens our understanding of of how different communities are experiencing loss and uh, responding to it. Um, over the last um, ten years, I was just thinking. Um, I've been intensely involved in public campaigns, uh, which I've never brought to my academic life in the center. I mean, these are just not part of my scholarly life. They are something that I do outside on my own time. Um, one has dealt with air pollution in Delhi and local Delhi politics and Delhi government. Um, the other has uh, been most recently about um, the reconstruction uh, of what is called the Central Vista in, in, uh, in the heart of historic heart of Delhi one of its historic hearts. Um, and the third has been uh, down south in Tamil Nadu with uh, fishing and coastal communities where I had a bunch of um, friends in, um, in the environmental movements there. And they've uh, been working very intensely with um, how um, marine pollution and the building of uh, ports and oil spills and so on are impacting um, uh, fishing communities, uh, which are also often low caste communities in uh, in coastal Tamil Nadu, in Chennai, and around it. Um, and again, uh, I've always experienced these movements and participated in them as an active citizen. Uh, and I've, you know, they've always they've always produced more euphoria than melancholia because you're you're working with people uh you know you're traveling to places um you're describing phenomena and you're engaged uh in a in a fully kind of public political sense with with your you know with your country or your community or life around you so in a sense one always feels energized by that um it's only later that you realize that what you're actually all involved in is something so devastating and perhaps irreparable, um, irreparable. Um, but, you know, I, I would welcome any kind of framing uh, architecture which allows one to, an intellectual architecture and a lexicon which allows one to systematize these ideas and practices and impulses that, and you know, activities that many of us have in our private lives, perhaps, um, you know, um, not necessarily in our research. Um, I wanted you to say uh, a little bit about a few things that you mentioned, um, but I'm also, uh, you know, happy to allow other people to, to, to ask their questions first, if they would like. Um, I, I just, maybe I'll just say one thing and then, and then, let others um, uh, speak, especially uh, Deepu, because he's he's an expert on on so many aspects of um, Delhi's environmental history and air pollution, garbage, waste, smoke, these kinds of things. Um, um, I noticed that you never mentioned Greta Thunberg, and and you mentioned Extinction Rebellion, but I think that in many ways Greta has been um, such a symbol around the world uh, of how the next generation has, uh, you know, this, this fact of environmental 
deterioration and loss uh, as the first item on, on a kind of generational agenda. Um, and, and she has got uh, a huge response from, from people around the world. Um, I understand that some of it was lost in, in the pandemic, perhaps. Uh, but uh, I wondered if there was any particular reason why uh, it didn't strike you to, 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 to talk about her or whether you have a critique of the way in which she approaches these things or maybe she's too young, I don't know. Um, but uh, apart from that, I mean, I think, uh, I think maybe Deepu, you might like to say a few things or respond in some way or, um, yeah, yeah. Wait, I, I really like the way you formulated this mental health part of it. Uh, because, and it being somewhat incomplete unless you also act, uh, attend to the acts of repair. Because people are not just making theories, they're also doing something to address that situation. So that, that is very, a lot to think with there. Uh, I had two concerns. Uh, one is, uh, you know, uh, certainly, like many others, one would like to consider climate alongside many other such issues rather than isolate it. But if one is to do that, so is there a difference between climate and climate change? Because people have lived and adapted to hostile climates for a very long time. And climate change is something that we started talking about recently. And in the older sense of the climate, geography was more important than time. So I was wondering if uh, you know one one needs to work with these two, two different senses of climate. And the other question that I had was, uh, you know, on the category of experience. Now, one of the things that some anthropologists have argued that climate does not follow from environment. It does not have a local experience in the same way because it relies on data and numbers in ways that other environmental issues may or may not rely. And this is uh, a recent book that I'm reading by Emma Knox called Thinking Like Climate, where she's, she's making this argument quite forcefully. So if you want to respond to this other strain in anthropology that says it's not just about the local experience that you write when you're writing about climate but you have to write about the way climate change is gets formulated as a mode of thinking. For, for um, these comments, I'm just wondering, um, there's a few things that came to my mind um, because you said in my scholarly life and in my private life, and I see increasingly, especially with young people, um, this feeling of you know being a scholar also means being being engaged in some ways and i would also argue that you know the kind of work that everyone of us does namely writing is also a form of activism in a sense you don't need to go out on the streets and protest but increasingly there is i would say people who say you know, we can't have these kinds of attached, whatever we do, scholarship, being act. So, so this is just an ethical issue of being a scholar. That's what I feel that especially so many younger people now feel. Um, yeah, the, the fishing, yeah, it's interesting. We have a colleague who works on coal mines and fishing, and he shows very well in Tamil Nadu also how you know, this fishing, so the, these coal mines take not only away livelihoods, um, but also the identity of these fishermen and how they, again, in a mode of the despite, go on fishing. And there's, it's a, there's a lot about to be said about caste here, because if this fish, these fish, this fish is declared like as toxic fish, then the ones who collect these fish and are work with these fish and earn livelihoods, you know, that also, you know, reflects back on them and, um, and being very low caste themselves 
they take issues with that. So it's highly complex uh, things going on here. Said Greta Thunberg, there's not a, no not any reason. It's just like I I just composed this talk very quickly, and of course, had I had more time, more time, Greta would definitely. She is still an important, not only actor, but also an icon that inspires so many. And what I find interesting is that, you know, there's so many different climate activism groups. So you have Greta Thunberg, Friday for Future, like you have the more like last generation. I don't know how active all these groups are here. I'm not sure, but we have them very prominently and more aggressively, uh, you know, tying themselves to streets and, and so on and uh, destroying um, artwork and things. And then you have the Extinction Rebellion. And Re Extinction Rebellion is so interesting because, exactly because this kind of similarly, simultaneously refashioning selves and environments. So yeah, but no, there was not a reason. This is interesting, the climate and the climate change. Um, I think, I don't know if I have much to say on that, just apart, just, just to say that, because when you said that climate was related to geography and place, while, you know, yeah. And thanks, I, I see this as a just suggestion because you said climate change, climate relates to place in debates while climate change actually relates to time. And um, and so ideas of you know Indian Anthropocene in climate change in India that you you know that some colleagues argue for try to bring these things together and uh, yeah it, it it reminds me bringing things together that are yeah no I, I don't go into um, Chakrabarti now but the, he also tries to bring historical and deep time together but this is different this is just for time but I think this is important and I don't know this literature on climate. And, and yeah, good to to think with um, and experience. Um, this is this is also interesting. Of course, you're, you're you're totally right. So sometimes climate change becomes experiential if you live near the mountains. Where earlier, I mean, you also. I just quoted Ananya. Also, my own experience that I saw the snow in the mountains. Like I did skiing as a child, it was not a problem. There was never any problem, but now it's just this white um, strips of snow produced by artificial like things and glaciers. And, you know, so what I'm saying is that climate change for many people is experiential. On the other hand, you're right. And this connects then the whole climate change debate with the COVID debate because, because of the prominence and the rele absolute relevance of data. And um, and then I think what's interesting is Hannah Knox's work, thinking like a climate, but there's also others, and I'm just lacking the the names now. But people who have worked on how people, as a form of activism and knowing their environment, use, for example, the Geiger counters in the aftermath of Fukushima, for example. So how actually so that there need not be a sharp distinction between data and experience because these data then become part of people's ways of knowing, making sense of, and then finally probably also experiencing the world. Although again, I, I'm not sure, but um, yeah, does that, it, doesn't, it doesn't respond really, but you are completely right. So yeah, it, it's, it's an important point. And also then, I mean, how climate change then becomes an idiom to talk about things such as, you know, heat and rain and more experiential things. How does it become political? How does it become maybe economic? And how, you know, what kind of work does this climate change as a, as an idiom, as a, you know, thing do. So there's all different things. And I'm curious really to, to learn more about, about that. Yeah.
Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lang, for this uh, wonderful lecture. Uh, just two uh, quick comments. One is uh, in your audio work, Depression in Kerala, you are proposing and you are critiquing the model through de phenomenological perspective that entire things has been de phenomenalized in terms of Ayurveda and, and, and the modern, as a modern treatment. Here uh, you're talking about, uh, I think, shift from phenomenology to structural critique for, uh, for, for mental health. But you could not, I mean, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, there's another development which we could call it new liberal cities. And 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 the, the, the and and the model which you are proposing in the critique as a model, I think, would be equally applicable, and has become more important in the context of new liberal cities. So do uh, this is the one. Second, uh, you propose a model of minor repairs. I think it would it may be a metaphor as well, but in the context of major destruction, where do you see also limit to minor? Repair because there are two arguments. One is by communitarians, and communitarian argument would uh, insist on minor repairs. But there are other people like Harvey, David Harvey, and others, and he would go for uh, a major repairs. I mean, at least a major construction of utopia against the new liberal cities and expansion of cities. So these are the two. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think I have to ask you back for the first question, but the second one, um, it's interesting. Um, there could be um, critique, um, the the well-known critique against, you know, these taking these minor interventions seriously. And maybe I should uh, say a few words about the background. So what um, um, I think in anthropology, at least um, we can observe is a big, unsatisfaction with the usual mode of critique that has been there for decades, uh, which is not saying that this critique is wrong. On the contrary, this critique is super right. You know, we have to constantly critique, you know, neoliberalism and whatever, although in a more like nuanced way, probably because it's, yeah. but there's an unease with this of people saying, okay, we know this critique in and out, we know already. And you know, you know, what about studies who set out to demonstrate again and again and again, the same kind of structures that we already know? So this is the background how, uh, in, um, against which I would say that in anthropology, some people have tried to think and then probably it's a, it's a bad term, what's called beyond critique. And beyond critique is not saying, okay, now we just buy everything, right? They didn't buy in. It's saying, yeah, building on critique. Can we, can we ask new questions? Can we look differently? Can we look new concepts? Can we just, you know, can we develop new conceptual lenses to grasp what's now going on? building on earlier critique, using them, but going beyond. So that's, you know, and I think in this, um, I'm not sure if Kassan would agree, but I think he would, um, um, you know, similarly, the kind of thinking that, um, as suggested by our director, Ursula Rao, um, as we do in the department at the moment is, you know, this living in the mode of the despite, it's not like we know, you know, resistance in and out. Um, but, you know, these kind of, you know, somehow grasping things in a different way. And this is still in its infant shoes, you know, it's, just, it's not very developed and, and neither is this minor. There are some people writing about minor without really cl clearly defining it and not saying that minor is opposed to major because one of the things is that really the major actually articulates in the minor and these minor acts um, address major issues and so on. So this is the background. What was the question? Um, I think this also answers your question. <laughs> the other one, um, I don't know if I really got you corrected. So uh, you talked about phenom from moving from phenomenology to structure. And I'm not sure if I would agree because I don't really... Uh, I'm not sure. And and the other thing is neoliberal cities um, and whether 
this applies at all. I, I didn't really get the question. <laughs> but maybe you can just try it to ask it again. Am I saying this? Interesting. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Making can on, on some standard practices and uh, emotive things are out of the place for, for standardization of the practices. But in this case, I mean, and I see some shift from your earlier work to the structure. I mean, uh, uh, in which uh, things are taking place. Okay. The shift I would, as I would conceive of it, is that in my earlier work, I would be interested. This was more a classical um, anthropological approach to how to ask how a concept, you know, that's been that emerges out of a specific socio-economic, cultural, historical context, like depression. What happens if it, you know, travels into not only into a place like Kerala, but also into intellectual and practical spaces such as Ayurveda and um, and and even ritual healing? So, what just happens with this concept? How does it change? And then, how does this concept affect the way people experience their emotional states? So that was the early approach, and this approach now that I'm still developing. It doesn't ask so much about the traveling of concepts. It's, it just, I mean, it's also part, but I'm... Mm, mm, I'm not yet sure because this is still developing. I'm not... I feel I need to ask new questions. So I could, of course, one could ask about, you know, so there's environmental grief and then it travels, it comes, it's comes here maybe and and it, it reaches all different sorts of contexts and then what happens but i think yeah i think what i want to do now is to take actually things more seriously so you said phenomenological or de-phenomenology i'm not sure what you mean but what i really do now think is important to take seriously this deep feeling of melancholia solastalgia despair and and start thinking from this in in instead of just saying you know this is all deconstructed and so on i think that's it but i'm not yet sure um, yeah so thank you for this really generative and thought-provoking talk so i wanted to maybe just continue on the line of some of the questions that deepu raised and I was particularly interested in just the ways in which we describe the world and these questions that you kind of raised again and again about vocabulary. And I was just wondering how you kind of theorize the relationship between sort of analysts categories, if we're to call them that, and actors categories. So mm -hmm. the ways that you have of talking about these categories as an analyst versus how people talk about climate change in situ and the ways that you observe them anthropologically. So. I was just thinking that one way that I see climate change coming up all the time, at least in kind of liberal educated circles in the US is that people just say, oh, it's it's climate change. So th th it'll be like raining or something in February and they'll say, oh, it's climate change. And it's kind of like a way of just fatalistically dismissing the whole phenomenon as, as this thing called climate change. And since you are trying to develop such a robust vocabulary for articulating this, I'm I'm kind of interested in how sort of how you see that as a question about finding, on the one hand, a set of really robust um, kind of words for talking about different experiences, and the other, the fact that climate change can kind of sometimes almost be reductive of the complexities and fullness of, of human experience. So, I mean, in a way, it, it, can, it can kind of sometimes be that we just say, oh, climate change then becomes the explanation for whole hosts and sets of problems. So. I think there's a dynamic that you're playing at that I'd be interested to to hear more about. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, indeed, I think I'm more interested in these ideas of new or 
old forms, maybe new forms of suffering and mental health as an actor's category. And then it becomes problematic because if you ask, I mean, this is just an epistemological slip. If you ask into local articulations of something like environmental grief, then you then it becomes at the same time an analytical category. And then you look for, you know, local articulations of it. But I think I'm <laughs> this still, it's just ambivalent and it's it's difficult, but I think what's more important is really to refrain from these terms that just threw out on the yeah and and really um start by looking into ways people talk about how it feels to them um what they experience and not the climate change but maybe the heat or i don't know the asthma the burning eyes and and so on but on the other hand, I find it interesting was what Ananya said about, you said that this gives me a language or this might give, provide a language to finally talk about things we could not talk before. And so there's this kind of tension, ambivalence, or maybe an even openness of on the one hand, looking into the generative um, possibilities of these terms even politically and on the other hand really looking at them as more actors categories so this is just a blah blah it's not really this uh, you know it's but I think it would be <laughs> it would be really interesting to find a frame to look at these things together maybe you have some suggestions huh? Me uh and -huh. You see? Okay. Thank you for the interesting lecture. How do you think we can study the relationship between urban mental health and toxic urban environments ethnographically? I also wanted to ask your opinion on ideas by sociologists like Nicholas Rose and Des Fitzgerald. Uh, like the urban brain and neurosocial conceptions of mental health. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. So thanks for this question. Um, so the first question was, how can we study ethnographically? What's that? Urban mental health and toxic environmental. So. I think part one of the answer to question number one would be to really start looking into things that I already mentioned, into the ways people relate to lost environments, lost urban environments emotionally and psychologically and existentially. So how people talk about this kind of loss. And this is, I think, something that I, you know, also laid out a little bit in this talk. Another different possibility of maybe another research would be to look into, to take these kinds of scientific studies on the relationship of pollution, for example, air pollution, maybe also other toxicants and brain activities really seriously and look not only into what they say, but also how these things then become alive. So how, what is the work that these kinds of connections do? For example, political work, you know, 
activism or 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 other kinds of work you know taking these relationships between toxicities toxins in the in the cities and brain activities and then finally mental health seriously and also then exploring their uneven um forms of exposure and so on and um i didn't so far read fitzgerald's and rose's work although i'm familiar with the term of neuro was that neuro so here is a third word neurosocial ecological social something like that and he talks a lot about what was that what he, yeah but there was a third one so it was neurosocial and then third you know he uh, no, but but he um, Nicholas Rose, you know, and others, they had this uh, this article and that where they put they they brought three different things together. I can't remember now, and I know that he talks about milieu and so on. But um, I, I think I'm too unfamiliar with uh, the whole like background of this new concept. Um, but maybe um, what I just said fits a little bit in in this. But but surely something to 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 consider more. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, Claudia, we, we have time and you're here. So I just wanted to ask you a few things or maybe you, um, you know, I put them on the table so that you can take them back when you're trying to think more about this project. Um, one is that, you know, one of the one of the earliest critiques of industrial and technological modernity, I think, um, from the 20th century came out of India from Gandhi and Tagore. And um, for them, what we today would call an environmental manifesto was inextricably tied to their um, critique of nationalism and colonialism and war. So the political and the environmental were always in both Tagore and Gandhi articulated together and their critique was overarching. So it would appear that they were talking about um, political conditions, but in both their writings, uh, in different ways, and sometimes they disagreed with one another. Um, there was a strong, uh, prescient, you know, uh, sense that industrial, technological, colonial, and capitalist modernity uh, was essentially um, destructive, not only of political autonomy and the rights of 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 human beings everywhere, but also of, of, of lived environments and beloved environments in a sense. Um, so, so, so that's a sort of, um, it's a very clear statement and it comes uh, from the heart of the anti-colonial movement. Um, I mean, you can see it in Gandhi's Hind Swaraj, which he wrote in 1909. You can see it in uh, Tagore's lectures against nationalism, which are throughout World War I, um, and so on. So I think that tradition of uh, understanding environmental causes or the environmental movement as a form of political activism has continued in India, at least throughout the 20th century. These two things were not separate. You know, you didn't have green people and then political people. Uh, they were the same. Like if you look at some of the some of the movements around deforestation, or you look at the the long movement against the Narmada uh, Dam, or you look at um, uh, even more recent uh, movements that have to do with coal mining and uranium mining and the loss of tribal homelands and the entry of big capital into the heart of um, 
uh, where tribal communities live and their livelihoods and their ways of life and their life worlds and so on. I mean, everybody from Vinoba Bhave to, you know, Medha Patkar uh, and on um, have have had this understanding that uh, political rights are inextricably linked to um, environmental health, in a sense, for communities. Um, and there's been a strong sense of the local in, in these movements. Um, so there's that legacy, which is, I think, probably still present you know, in, I don't know ethnographically if this is the case, but I think in many parts of the country, people are thinking about the, their own climate crisis, their own environmental crisis, their own pollution crisis, etc. Uh, but they are probably drawing from these longer uh, uh, ways of thinking about activism and, and citizenship and so on. Um, but at the same time, when a country like India as a nation state goes to the climate talks, uh, you know, or goes to the intergovernmental panel on climate change, or, you know, goes to sign all these agreements, um, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in any of the, the big fora, uh, which have arisen in the last 20, 20 30 years, which are global, um, India speaks a very different language. You know, I mean, the Indian state speaks a very different language. Uh, they still talk about rights, but it's almost as if they're talking about the right to pollute, you know, or the right to have emissions because the West had emissions for so long and we never had our turn, um, or the right to mine, or the right to, you know, um, in essence, do everything that has been done for two or 300 years or more in the West uh, without check. Uh, and that, you know, we haven't sort of caught up with that. Um, and so we shouldn't be asked to stop altogether when we haven't even yet achieved that level of uh, development or that level of modernity or that level of prosperity, et cetera, um, regardless of the cost. And, and, and of course, this is completely self-destructive because the cost is there for all to see. And this is one of the worst affected parts of the world. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the kinds of drastic degradation that you see of the environment here. Um, so I, I mean, I'm, I mean, this is not for you to answer, but I wonder how, you know, we can have the, the right vocabulary, the right legacy, the right political memory. Uh, and at the same time that it just doesn't touch uh, foreign policy or climate policy. Uh, anymore, it seems, in the kind of talk that, you know, our leaders talk when they go abroad, or when they bring G20 here, or whatever it is. Um, so, I think that, I think there's a lot more in India, you know, to explore for you. But the difference might be that you would have to enter more directly into movements that appear to be political or that seem primarily to be political and therefore are quite dangerous to study. For example, the Naxalite movement, uh, you know, essentially tribal movements uh, are wars against the state or are seen as wars against the state, but at some level, they're also wars over resources and natural resources. And increasingly they become uh, forms of rebellion against uh, an environmental crisis that is worsening by the day, um, you know. Um, I was recently in Bhopal for the first time and there's a big tribal museum there. And everybody said, oh, you must go see the new tribal museum. You must go and see the new tribal museum. And it was just horrible. Um, First of all, because of, I mean, it was not a very well designed museum, but also because it had this air of intense melancholia. I mean, it was dark, 
everything was dark. There were these complicated tableau and exhibits. Um, there were, you know, dozens of different tribes from different parts of India, and they had recreated their habitats. So they had recreated the kind of houses they built, the kinds of ritual objects they have, they had, you know, the kinds of worship they, they uh, follow, or the kinds of, you know, uh, deities they, they, they hold, uh, they venerate, etc. But it seemed incomprehensible, first of all. And it also seemed completely dead, or just either it's from, you know, a long lost past, or it's literally, I mean, it was so alien and alienating. And I think that reflects our inability to relate to, you know, a huge segment of, of our population, which lives by rules of the relationship between humans and nature that are now completely inaccessible to us. I mean, we don't even understand them, leave aside being able to evaluate them or follow them or anything like that. I mean, the it just seemed like a crypt, that museum. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen it. It, it just seemed like a reliquary, you know, and not like a museum of, of an anthropological museum, which is what it's supposed to be, you know. Um, you may have seen anthropological museums. Every, I mean, they're everywhere in Berlin and 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 oh, you know, all over the the colonial world, you know. Um, but uh, I just, you know, it strikes me now to hear you speak that uh, it is melancholic for a reason. You know, <laughs> that museum. It's not just bad design or bad lighting. You know, because it it in a sense shows you forms of life with which the dominant um, civilization or the, the dominant culture, the hegemonic culture that we live in, which is neoliberal, et cetera, um, has increasingly no communication, no relationship, no learning, no memory of it, you know, just no, I mean, it's just completely alien. That's, that's the only word I keep thinking of. You know, I was thinking earlier about enchantment and disenchantment, but that's not even it. It's just utterly, it's utterly strange and it's utterly without the ability to speak to us because we have consigned it to this kind of tomb-like, uh, you know, place in our imagination of what India is. I mean, it's, it, it's seen as a, as a, as a, as a sort of, you know, great sign of diversity that, oh, we have all these different cultures, including tribal cultures. But, you know, those are not the cultures that are teaching us how to live better. Um, you know, we don't know how, you know, they manage to have the kind of survival that they did, uh, which has been completely undone in the last 150 years, you know, or even less, maybe half that time. In, in in our um, in our country anyway um, and I I know I'm going on a little long but I you know these these are all things I've been wanting to talk to you about I mean I would say in Europe also uh, while you see the green movements in places like um, the Netherlands or Germany or you know um, the the Scandinavian countries um, I mean, I am always struck by how they are also the countries where you had the most totalitarian and and authoritarian and fascist politics, and where you had the greatest violence um, in in you know in the middle of the last century, and um, and then you wonder again whether environmental destruction and and political destruction are not intrinsically connected, uh, you know, in a way that can't be wished away. I mean, you can't make up your political bad karma by having good green karma. You know what I mean? <laughs> because, because you know, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's just irreparable damage that was done. You know, um, so I don't know if you have. If you have thoughts about this as as a European, you know, as a German, but also as a, as a scholar and anthropologist, 
goes to other parts of the world that have very different histories like india um you know and that have their own histories also of environmentalism you know not just of violence against the environment but also of environmentalism um very very kind of proud histories in some sense um which are now sort of i don't know which should should help us at a, at this time of crisis but don't seem to necessarily be uh, providing us with the kind of direction that you know ideally we should have at least in this country we should have i don't care about anybody else but we have no excuse um because you know there's been thinking about this uh here for at least 100 years if not more and i mean you can respond as you wish and we can also stop um it's 5:30 uh ayodhya are we supposed to stop now or are we meant to continue or um i don't know as far as the 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 online version is concerned i mean if you if you if people are people have left okay so we've come to an we've come to an end of our time but if you would like to say something just by way of conclusion we can we certainly have you know 2 3 4 5 minutes to do that and then we can close the close the stream well, thank you um um these are all incredibly helpful remarks and um openings for thinking um i don't know if i can say something by way of concluding but just maybe some thoughts um um i was just i'm wondering about tagorian gandian environmentalism and their present lives and maybe merging or not or being recognized or not or recognizing or not um, um these global movements so this is one thing and i know that i mean obviously there's others there's been others in india and, and 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 from abroad who study these kinds of environmentalist movements it's just like i don't know enough and the second thing about this depressing opal tribal museum experience that is interesting for a reason for many reasons but one of the reasons is that people who've been working who are working on global maybe environmental movements have pointed out how the idea of the noble savage becomes a new or gets a new life within these movements so you know and and actively looking for guidance in idealized um indigenous communities is what is one of the characteristics of the, many of these new environmental movements and there's a kind of idealization and a movement back to the you know the the noble savage and so on going on here but not only that it is that in latin america the zapatistas in mexico many other places they know and they have very much learned about new possibilities of articulation or of articulating their political ecological interests within this framework and know you know that somehow people are looking for their guidance basically and so this is what is happening in other parts of the world so i was i'm wondering about the relationship both of these more historical gandian tagorian others naxalit movements i mean naxalits have been like um indigenous communities as you said but so on the one hand there so so what about the relationship actually of any form of environmental activism and indigenous communities is it always like this alienated is there also some kind of romanticizing maybe i i don't think so and then i wonder why i don't know um these are not very elaborate but it's just the beginning then um oh yeah and in germany yeah and right wing I think there's a lot to be said about right environmentalism, so right-wing environmentalism, 
and um, and also Nazis' imaginations, ideas of the environment, nature, and we all know these images of Hitler in the mountains there and so. On. So, in Germany, at least, there's also a kind of right wing environmentalism, both historically and contemporary. And there's also within India a Hindutva environmentalism that also sits like squarely and comfortably somehow within these movements that you just mentioned. And it would also be interesting you know, to, to see what's happening here in terms of merging and clashing. So yeah, thanks. <laughs> so thank you and Ayodhya, I think we're closing. Thank you.